This is a beginner's training presentation about network hacking, so it's Network Hacking 101. I expect you to know the basics, what's an IP address, but no, we're not going to dive into packet headers and stuff like that. What exactly is network hacking? Usually when there's discussion about hacking, it's about hacking a host, a web server, a database server, something like that. And then you connect to the server, you try to fingerprint it to determine what exactly, what kind of host is it, and how do I get in. This presentation is about what can you do to make sure that the host comes to you. This is a basic scenario. You go to your favorite coffee house, you bring your laptop, you open up your laptop, you've been there before, it auto-connects to the network, you open up a browser and go to facebook.com. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit blurry. What should happen? You connect to the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi works with probes and probe responses. You see an SSID, the SSID sends out probes, you respond to a probe, you enter the authentication uh, step, which is basically a very old step from the time of web. You enter the authentication step, you associate with the access, and you have a wireless connection. That's the first step. After that, you need an IP address. When you connect to the Wi-Fi, your laptop doesn't have an IP address, which is kind of necessary if you wish to communicate with a remote web server. So what do you do? You try to get one. The basic mechanism for that is DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. You send out a broadcast to all the hosts in the local network. In the local subnet, destination MAC address, all Fs broadcast, and say, who here hands out IP addresses? One or more servers answer, say, here's an offer. That's also uh, a message that sends to, uh, to the client. So, well, here's an offer. I have an IP address and some other settings for you. A client might receive multiple offers. Which one does it take? Usually the first one. It's as simple as that. The client then requests from that server, yes, I would like exactly that IP address, and if everything goes well, the server says, well, acknowledgement, you can have it, it's yours. Good. Your laptop now has an IP address. But it only knows its IP address, it has received its default gateway, it has received a DNS server, possibly some other stuff. Now it needs to resolve the name Facebook, so it needs to access the DNS server. It's probably not in the local subnet. Say you use Google DNS 8.8.8.8, .8 it's not in the local subnet. So you need to get out of the local subnet. Next step, ARP. The address resolution protocol. What is the MAC address that is connected to my default gateway, that matches my default gateway? So I send out a broadcast, again, layer 2, broadcast to all MAC addresses in the subnet. Who has, for example, 192.168.1.10, 1 if that's my default gateway. Please tell 192.168.150.150, just an example. If you're lucky, the default gateway says, this is the MAC address, it's unicast, by the way, from the, MAC uh, from the default gateway to your uh, laptop, and says, this is it, this IP address lives at that particular MAC address. Good, now you know how to get off your local subnet. Next step, DNS. The first thing to you do is connect to the DNS server, www.facebook.com, I need to change that for an IP address, because my laptop doesn't understand the URL itself, it needs an IP address. So first, you go to the DNS server to resolve the name to an IP address, and then you're able to connect to the server. Connecting to the server is as simple as, well, there's a, a, a Wireshark trace of the DNS, etc. This is another website, but the principle is the same. 
a DNS query, a query response, and then you're able to initiate a session. And if everything goes well, you get your Facebook. I repeat, what could possibly go wrong? Does this look familiar? <laughs> for, the, for those who, who don't know what this is, this is a, a, f a fake Wi-Fi access point. You think that thing is massive? I have one right here. This is all there is. With this and a 9 volt battery, if I go to a local coffee house, I can score dozens of Facebook logins. It's literally this small. This smart little box contains what is called a Ya Sager. Remember when I just talked about the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi probes from the SSIDs? When you open your laptop, it sends out probes to all the SSIDs that has, have been ever configured on it. So your, lo your, your home network, your work uh, 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 network, your, uh, the friends network where you're also connected to. It sends out probes. What this smart little box does to every single one of those probes, it says, yes, I have that. You can connect to me now. And if you have auto-connect switched on as well, it will connect to this little box. Basically, you connect to this little box and it'll eat your credentials. It'll also direct you to, this, to the website, but it, now it has your credentials as well. So this can happen when connecting to the network. Next step, DHCP. We just said you can have multiple DHCP servers in the network and the client usually picks the first one. But what happens if that other DHCP server isn't exactly friendly and tries to redirect your traffic through a host which can capture your credentials, redirect you to malicious websites, uh, try to, to load malware onto your computer? It can. When you send out DHCP discover, it lands with possibly the, the, the proper DHCP server and the rogue DHCP server, which hands out uh, a bogus, well, not to, at least not bogus, not the official default gateway, but another host. It can be a compromised host, it can be a, a host dedicated to capture traffic, and it performs a man-in-the-middle attack, and it even sends your network straight, straight straight through to the def original default gateway, so you actually have normal connectivity. And for select traffic, it can intercept, it can change, it can lock, it can do all kinds of nasty things. So this is what can happen with a rogue DHCP server. If the attacker is too late and you already have a proper IP address, why not change it? Why not change the MAC mapping to the IP address of, say, the default gateway. This is called ARP spoofing. There's a mechanism in ARP that says gratuitous ARP. That means I'm sending from that attacker a gratuitous ARP to the victim. Say, ooh, you know that default gateway, that 1.1 address that usually lives at the MAC address ending with 0A68? It now lives at this particular MAC address. And that's the attackers. What does this accomplish? This accomplishes that all traffic that you normally send to the default gateway now gets sent to the attacker. Now for the return traffic. For the return traffic, you also send a gratuitous ARP to the gateway, to the router. It says, oh, you know that, that client that that's, has been connected to you, the uh, 1.106 IP address that used to live at 9FEE, it now also lives at a different MAC address. And in this case, even if you ha already had a proper IP address, the attacker's machine now sits right in the middle of everything that's communicated outside of the network. DNS, uh, web uh, traffic, everything. Now for DNS hijacking. Remember the step? DNS, you perform a lookup, you translate your name www.facebook.com to an IP address. What happens if you don't connect to a proper DNS server, but one who gives the wrong answer? And not just a wrong answer, but a very, very wrong answer. You connect to an evil DNS server by way of whatever. You can root or 
change things on router level or intercept on, on any of the ways we uh, discussed before. And you connect to an evil server, even though you think you're connecting to Facebook. Underwater, the evil server can even connect to the Facebook server, so it really gets you the genuine content, but instead it can capture login details, it can uh, clean out your, uh, your account details, it can go through your contact list, it can do anything uh, the, the server wants. So these are just a few examples of the steps that can go wrong with the traffic. Other things that can happen is intercepting traffic. You don't need even need to alter it. If you get somewhere in between the line of communication, you can intercept traffic and you can learn a lot from it. You can use NAT. If you, s you NAT the 888 DNS request to a different address, you're already there. If you use a web cache communication protocol or some kind of proxying or some kind of Linux bridging, the traffic passes through, you don't even notice it. It's transparent proxy, transparent bridging, it's really transparent to the end user. The Pineapple also has another nifty little feature called SSL strip. For those who actually use Facebook, Facebook is now HTTPS. That means you get a certificate. Uh, if you open your browser and you enter HTTPS Facebook.com, you're safe. If you enter Facebook.com, the first thing it us usually tries is connect to port 80, unencrypted traffic. The thing is, if you connect it through the pineapple, it can actually go to the HTTPS Facebook site. So that part of the communication is encrypted just fine. But the, part, the communication between the pineapple and the victim uh, client is just plain text. So username and password are easily learned from this. There's also some other uh, techniques called switch port analyzer. Uh, it's, it's a configuration option on a switch. It, you uh, point to a port where your client is on connected to. Uh, okay, every frame that goes to or from that particular port, make a copy of it and send it out that port. If you attach a sniffer to that particular port, you learn every single frame that packet sends or receives. Also quite powerful. Then there's things you can do with routing. You can uh, if you have c uh, control over the router, you can route 888 to some other subnet where you have a bogus IP address or whatever. Y you can use routing as well to intercept traffic. There are many, many more techniques, but I think there are other presentations today, so let's not go too deep into them. Countermeasures. Every single attack we just discussed has a countermeasure. The terms I use here, by the way, are Cisco-specific. I'm a Cisco guy. But other vendors also have similar techniques. I just don't know what they're called exactly. Wi-Fi intercept the pineapple. First step, be very careful. If you're at your local coffee house and you see, hey, why does my laptop tell me I'm connected to the home network? You know something's off. The other technique, VPN. If you have a proper VPN endpoint for a secure environment, for your hackerspace, to your home network, etc., if the pineapple's in between and allows you to connect to VPN, you're usually safe. Everything that goes through, to the, VP through the VPN is encrypted, the pineapple can't intercept it. So you're reasonably safe with it. Rogue DHCP server, there's a switch port security feature that's called DHCP snooping that actually tracks each DHCP discover and offer that go through a, a client port and logs it. And only a selected port where actual DHCP server is located is allowed to send offers. So if you plug in your Rogue DHCP server on a, a, a normal client port, if it sends an offer, it gets dropped by the switch. It's one of the many, many possible techniques. But on a network layer, this is defense against someone plugging in a rogue DHCP server with malicious intent or even without malicious intent. ARP spoofing. The same uh, switch port uh, security feature called DHCP snooping now knows what MAC addresses and what IP addresses match. So if you send gratuitous ARP, 
it gets dropped by the switch. It's dynamic ARP inspection, it knows where each host lives. If it sends gratuitous ARPs for, for hosts, it definitely is not true. So remember the, uh, the attacker laptop that's uh, trying to send gratuitous ARP for both gateway and the uh, victim's laptop gets dropped by the switch. Therefore, making the ARP spoofing attack very improbable at least. DNS hijacking. Be careful. Again, there are sometimes there are small telltales, like what I just said. The uh, Facebook is now an uh, HTTPS website, SSL encrypted. When you look at your browser bar, you should see it's HTTPS. If it's not, there may be some DNS hijacking going on. And again, if you're allowed to send a VPN, uh, to uh, set up a VPN through whatever unsecure networks, you're usually safe as well. Some environments, for whatever reason, don't allow the, uh, the setup of a VPN. Thankfully, it's allowed here. <laughs> but some people, it's, it's not allowed to set up a VPN. Then it's up to you to determine if you trust the network enough to send over your username and password or other credentials over the line. That specific implementation usually works very well because it's HTTPS for most of the intercept traffic. And, yeah. and finally, intercepting web traffic, again, verify SSL status. If you know you need to connect to an, a, uh, to an SSL uh, secured website, like banking, for example, check if it really is encrypted. And again, VPN. VPNs are quite popular these days, and for a reason. They can block many of these attacks. If they allow VPN to pass through, and like AK says, if you use uh, SSL encryption over uh, port 443 to your VPN terminator, it usually works. Some interesting terms to Google if you want to take a closer look at all this. DHCP hacking, it sends out all kinds of stuff for uh, Proof of concept, stuff like that, ARP spoofing as well. Uh, the pineapple is actually from ACK5. Uh, th they make other cool stuff as well. Cane Enable is a very nifty tool there for a man in the middle attack. The gratuitous ARP is uh, very easy to pull off with that one. It also contains loads and loads of other hacking tools, but for some reason, virus scanners don't really like the tool. For a lab environment, it's awesome to play around with. Please please don't do it in a production environment without express written permission. If you, do, if you don't uh, cover yourself, don't come to me. I know nothing. And finally, the Wi-Fi hacking, there are a number of tools for uh, all sorts of intercept, replay attacks, uh, trying to find weak keys, etc. Uh, Kismet and Aircrack NG are just a few of the examples that uh, are usually uh, used for Wi-Fi interception, hacking, cracking, etc. Well, now we get to the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? Yes? Suggestions? Uh, uh, when connecting to a network, and uh, when it's not secure, uh, you uh, are most at risk. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when you are on a network and uh, it's not secured, like it's an open network, you're most at risk. So uh, always, uh, when you have to, uh, when you have to use an open network, always delete your network would be an, a great tip. Uh, and uh, as far as the ARP uh, poisoning goes, uh, the man in the middle framework is uh, uh, one neat one as well, uh, especially on uh, uh, Unix environments. Well, uh, these days, um, major sites like uh, Facebook, uh, your Gmail, your uh, banking uh, use uh, a technique uh, called uh, public key pinning. Um, and uh, transport, strict transport uh, headers. So um, basically, when you are on an, uh, not on a trusted uh, network, 
the server uh, doesn't send any unencrypted uh, traffic, so your um, uh, credentials are uh, always encrypted, or you can't uh, you can't use uh, the website. So um, I think this uh, kind of techniques um, are not related to Facebook or banking, but only to the smaller. Uh, you know, a, f a forum of uh, or something. Uh. That's really an excellent example. Say you connect to a forum, your credentials will get sniffed, and an attacker can log into your forum profile and see your email. <coughs> Say, for example, it's a Gmail address. To be quite honest, how many of you use the same password for your email and your forum account? For <laughs> I think we have an intelligent room here. Ask, ask yourself how intelligent is the rest of the world. <laughs> I think you have a reasonable chance of at least half of the, your, your, uh, your victims use the same password. If you use the same password, you get access to the mailbox and you've got a whole lot of more information regarding the person. Good point. And I haven't actually tested this one, but the, for the Facebook example, um, the SSL strip uh, example for the, the pineapple, the communication between the pineapple and Facebook is 100% SSL secure encrypted. Shouldn't be any issue. It's just that the communication between the pineapple and the victim client is not. I haven't tested it actually yet. In that case, it is attack won't work. That's true. So the the major sites will work with the browsers to um, to tell like, oh, these URLs they need to be strict transport security. And there's also a method where you can put in the HTTP header, uh, HTTP header of your web server. You can. Uh, say, oh, yeah, we have trick transport security on this domain or on this subdomain, and the lifetime is X and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actually have this of on our uh, hackerspace website, bitlayer.nl, which is the complete domain. All subdomains need to be strict transport security, and we just put that in the HTTP header, and that means that we actually cannot have any hosts on our on our domain and subdomains that uh, has to be HTTPS, which is a bit annoying at sometimes, but. Uh. <laughs> But that, 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 that's, that's one. So if you're hosting, hosting a website, then uh, strict transport security, enabling that on your server is quite a good thing. Might be annoying, but it's very secure. It, it is only very recently that the Dutch banks have enabled this, because it has been only, I think, two years ago or something. There was some article, some pub, some some. Some, yeah, some Wi-Fi hacking things in the media, and then suddenly the banks were like, oh shit, we have to enable this stuff. It might be a good idea, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is that the pineapple is actually quite old, but every few years someone says, hey, we can use this to hack into public networks, etc." So every few years it gets some media attention, yes. Yeah, there are also two other points to hack uh, an HTTPS connection. Uh, the first one is, for example, on new Lenovo laptops, you get uh, pre-installed uh, root certificates with private keys. <laughs> so you could use that private key to um, talk plain SSL completely secure to the browser, and it will say, oh, I know this root certificate. And it will just say, oh, it's completely encrypted. Yep. Yes, some, some computer manufacturers deliver malware, including many, many extra features, yes. And there's also an interesting way about around uh, HTST, which is run an NTP server as well and say that it's suddenly 2100. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly high number of clients accept a sudden 100 year jump in whatever and will verify all the headers again. Uh, uh, NTP has another uh, 
issue. Uh, I have a son, uh, the one that's here knows about computers and the other one knows about gaming. And the one that knows about gaming has some friends on 9gag. And they told him that if you set your iPhone to 1 1 90 70, uh, the amazing thing will, uh, will uh, happen. Yeah, and it breaks. Uh, and, yeah. and it worked. <laughs> so, uh, 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 <laughs> issuing a DHCP with uh, NTP uh, uh, that uh, has a 1 1 90 70 uh, will not be fun in uh, like uh, a global office where they all have iPhones. Yeah. Did he also try to charge the iPhone in the microwave? Uh, no, and he did not cool it with ice packs as well. He uh, came to me uh, telling that suddenly uh, it uh, hang, and after a few days he confessed that he actually said it uh, uh, in another way. And um, my other son was bullying him <laughs> about it. <laughs> and learned, yeah, learned a valuable lesson with an expensive brick as a memento. Yeah. Uh, it, it took over two weeks to decharge it because it will overheat and uh, you need to cool it actually uh, to allow it to decharge and uh, uh, after a certain level it won't uh, um, uh, uh, decharge so you have to use uh, like elastics and Lego to push buttons uh, to allow it to <laughs> decharge. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. You can also uh, send it to Apple. <laughs> they will fix it for you. <laughs> uh, I heard some other uh, stories uh, about uh, uh, Apple and their um, uh, 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 genius bar. That they had so many, uh, so many uh, users coming in that uh, they will send you to well. Oh, okay. Um, I, I the point about. Uh, I believe the FBI is currently trying to get Apple to. <laughs> 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 about a uh, root uh, certificate on the Lenovo uh, laptops um, the, the thing about uh, public key uh, ping is, is uh, that uh, even if you have a valid uh, certificate the, the browser will reject, um, re reject the valid No, um, yeah, uh, f for the for Google, uh, the the Google website. For Google and for banking and for Facebook, that works. Uh, that's it. Yes, but uh, an, a website can send the first time its public key, and tell the browser uh, remember this. Yeah. And when you come the second time uh, to the website and the uh, the the key is is changed, mm -hmm. uh, then it will simply reject it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, usually NTP clients only accept a certain amount of deviation and a hundred years is almost certain more than what's usually acceptable. Regarding the NTP, I think this is because the NTP has an option that allows a larger step on the first start of the daemon. So when it first starts up, it allows a large step. This is probably to correct for broken system clocks or non-existent hardware clocks, something like that. So when it boots up, it will accept any time you get it. And later on, it will only accept small steps. Uh, so how about um, uh, IPv6 security? Because uh, your examples were only IPv4, <laughs> only legacy IP. That's true, yeah. but <laughs> then again, this is only a network hacking 101. Perhaps a different presentation next year. Yeah. Well, I can answer a few short things. Uh, a few of the attacks, for example, the DHCP and uh, the um, uh, ARP spoofing, they're all broadcast techniques. IPv6 doesn't have any broadcast, it's all multicast. So you have to have some different kind of attacks. You can't basically copy it. You have to reinvent it for IPv6. 
you can, of course, make your rogue GACP server member of the correct multicast group, but then again, there are usually security uh, configuration on the switches in order to prevent that. So well, one of the one of the big problems with IPv6 is um, is the, uh, the possibility to send rogue router advertisements, which is very common and hard to um, um, be, yeah because there's a lot of hardware that doesn't support security for this, like the older switches that uh, that's a bit problematic. But but there are there are uh, uh, like switches and and Wi-Fi gear out there that can do um, the um, that's a feature they call it a, a router advertisement guard, which is ba basically like an access list that's looking at the ICMP v6 traffic and the flags that are in there. So that basically saying, oh, every uh, router advertisement of error, uh, every IP6, uh, ICMP v6 packet that is sourced by users with these kind of flags that will be dropped. So that it's for the for the networking vendors, it is pretty easy to implement, but there are there's almost no support in there yet, so that's also another attack which you could do is that just go on like a Wi-Fi network and, and start broadcasting rogue router advertisements and then that will also result in clients getting your IPv6 addresses and get sending you traffic because more and more websites like Facebook are v6 now, so, uh, so that's also a major, major issue. Uh, Uh, and most public Wi-Fi spots don't actually have IPv6. So if you start broadcasting, there's IPv6 here, then your client will accept it. Oh, it upgraded. <laughs> Personally, I prefer my uh, Wi-Fi uh, client network, uh, guest networks, not to allow any communication between clients whatsoever. It's usually more secure. And uh, regarding the uh, IPv6, uh, on the, the VLAN security for the, the rogue uh, uh, router advertisements, the only technique I know that sh should help prevent it is uh, VACL, VLAN access list. But then again, uh, that's a Cisco technique I know. All the networks probably have techniques, probably even better, but I'm not sure what they're called or even exist. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, one thing about the uh, there was some mention about the open networks that you have to be very careful with. But if you have a WPA2 PSK network, that's also just as less secure as an open network because if you yeah, we I think this, this week we were with uh, with with honest with uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, uh, like, like his camera had a PSK network, uh, had a PSK network, and it was in Wireshark uh, with uh, your interface monitor mode. Very, very easy to decrypt the WPA2 uh, PSK packets because if you know the PSK and you capture the uh, WPA2 for a handshake, you can get uh, do the key derivation to uh, uh, calculate the the session key, and then you can just decrypt everybody's uh, traffic. So. That's also a. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that and yeah, so that's also also a problem. So if you think you can fix your security with PS, PSK, then that's the, the only thing that works for Wi-Fi uh, for for proper encryption is 802.1x, which could be more of a pain to set up. But that's the it's the only proper way to have uh, Wi-Fi security. security. Yeah. Not not many people use a radio service at home. Uh, I do. <laughs> <coughs> well, if no further questions, I'd like to thank you for attending. <laughs>